type 2? Diabetes, yeah. We're talking about diabetes. And we talked about uh, diabetes mellitus type 1. Uh, the uh, pancreas doesn't produce an, uh, insulin or not enough in insulin. It's usually ju juvenile onset. But uh, as I said last time, we're seeing a lot more adult onset type 1 diabetes. And it just doesn't make sense. This is something we've never seen before, but it has something to do with something, and we haven't quite figured it out yet. Or maybe they have figured it out, and they don't want to talk about it. A lot of times this has to do with, um, has to do with lifestyle, it has to do with uh, uh, genetics. <clears throat> so uh, uh, researchers don't like to talk about it, especially if they see it in a specific population and they don't want to say anything negative about that population, uh, high blood pressure in, in African Americans. It took forever. I mean, we knew that for the longest time, but it took forever for them to decide to, to tell African Americans that they, just because they're black, they have uh, a, a genetic proclivity for uh, high blood pressure. Well, it's the same. Yeah, it's turned on. Thanks. <laughs> uh, it's the same way with diabetes mellitus 2. Uh, type 2 diabetes, uh, we already knew that uh, people that accumulate fat around their, uh, their abdomens, around their gut, uh, are the individuals that uh, uh, develop type 2 diabetes. Uh, that's the shorter and squatter uh, genetic structures. Uh, the Pueblo Indians, uh, the uh, Tahano Odom, uh, about 80%. Uh, somebody wrote a paper uh, this weekend. I read a paper. <laughs> I was grading papers. I only graded five. I wasn't doing very good. Uh, it took me all day to do one. But uh, they were saying that the, uh, the Navajo have the highest uh, rate of diabetes at 47.3%. I know that's not true. <laughs> but that's okay. I didn't argue with them. Oh, you guys drive me nuts. You think you're the only tribe. <laughs> uh, like nobody else exists. Or maybe all the other people aren't real Indians or something. I haven't figured that one out yet. But I will. I'll figure it out. I think they're not effective and not up there, really. What? Of the other people? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're not real Indians. They're all mixed with other groups. Usually they're mixed with other tribes. But that's okay. We won't. We won't argue that point. Uh, which is a little strange. What, what was they do? Oh, um, North Dakota. North Dakota has four reservations. Uh, Montana has seven. Uh, Wyoming has two. South Dakota has five. Uh, but they're all primarily the same tribe. They're all they're all Sioux. They're all Sioux reservations except one. Turtle Mountain is uh, Chippewa. But the rest of them are Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota. <laughs> That's strange as that may seem. Which doesn't mean anything to you guys because you don't care. You don't even think they exist. Uh, but my wife is going up there. Um, she's, they're working on a church on one of the reservations. Spirit Lake. It used to be called Devil's Lake. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. Yeah, they have a problem with, with diabetes as well. Uh, but type 1 diabetes, of course, is the one that is uh, where insulin doesn't, where they're not producing insulin. Type 2 diabetes is where the, uh, the cells become insensitive to diabetes, or to uh, insulin, I'm sorry. Uh, and, of course, we have to give them medica medication to either stimulate the pancreas to produce excess amounts of insulin, or to make the, uh, the uh, cells sensitive to, uh, to, to insulin. Uh, the problem with, uh, with type 1 diabetes, of course, you can control, you can control the amount of, of insulin that the person takes in. So usually you can, uh, they, they can control their diabetes just with a shot or with a, an insulin pump. But with type 2 diabetes, we got a problem because eventually this, if the cells are are insensitive to insulin, uh, eventually you're going to get to a point where it doesn't matter how much insulin you put in that person's body, it's not going to work. And this is one of the reasons why type, type, type 2 diabetes can be so deadly. 
there's just nothing we can do about it. I mean, you can't force the body to start recognizing insulin. And if that happens, of course, now we get all kinds of interesting problems. Usually it's a circulation problem that, uh, that, that uh, kills the person. It's a circulation problem. Uh, so they lose their extremities and uh, maybe even go blind. Uh, in type, the only time we see really bad, people that with type 1 diabetes don't live forever, certainly. It's hard to live with diabetes uh, for an extended length of time. If they make it into their 60s and 70s, that's pretty good. Uh, the thing about type 2 diabetes, if they're, if they're good, sometimes we can keep them around for a while. Like if they change their lifestyle. But if they don't change their lifestyle, it's, you know, game over. <laughs> it's a video game talk, okay. <laughs> There's just not nothing we can do. But if they if they change their lifestyle, uh, they start exercising, they control their their uh, sugar intake, uh, then of, of course we're dealing with uh, we're dealing with a, a, the bo a human body that the cells are, are don't want to recognize sugar or insulin, and if we can uh, reduce the need, then potentially they can live for an extended time. This is the problem with diabetes. The problem with diabetes and the, and the reason that, that kills people is because people don't change their lifestyle. You got to lose weight. You don't have a choice. Well, you do have a choice. Of course, you have a choice. But if you don't lose weight, it's going to wipe you out quick, fairly quickly. It's just going to accelerate the process. Okay. And a lot of people, you can't talk them into exercising. You can't talk them into uh, changing the, their diet. Would you change your diet to save your life? What's the, what's the favorite food you, that you have? Cheesecake. Cheesecake. Would you stop eating cheesecake to save your life? Would you swear not to eat another piece of cheesecake to save your life? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. What's your favorite food, Hope? My favorite food would have to be Mexican food. Okay. Would you? Would you stop eating tacos to save your life? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can never have Mexican food again. <laughs> you have to eat, uh, the only food that you can eat is, is food that without any heat to it. Mm hmm. hmm. In, in the spices, you can't eat cayenne, for example. That's one of the spices that they use in Mexican food. Would you do that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Just to save your life? Good. Well, I like Thai food too, so. <clears throat> there you go. Well, well, it's the same spices, damn it. <laughs> so you can't eat that either. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, many people prefer the foods that they grew up, grew up with. So Italians eat Italian food. Uh, Greeks eat Greek food. Uh, they like the uh, spices, uh, basil and oregano for, for Italians. I'm not exactly sure what the what the Greeks eat. They eat a lot of feta cheese, which is pasta. goat cheese. And pasta. Yeah, yeah, pasta, of course, of one ilk or another. Uh, people are drawn to sweet foods and fatty foods because they taste uh, their taste is satisfying. People are also drawn to salty foods because we need the sodium chloride to maintain homeostasis. People who are hyperhydrated might actually crave salt. They should crave salt anyway. Uh, to, to pull some of that, that fluid out of their, out of their uh, system. People develop taste aversions to food that poisons them and makes them ill. And this, of course, is known as a taste aversion. Once upon a time in a land not that far away, uh, when I was 22 years old, I, uh, um, I ate dinner at my in-law's house, and they had Mexican hamburger help, taco hamburger helper with uh, uh, those chips. What kind of chips are those? Doritos. They were like Doritos. Anyway, they, they, you put a layer of that, and then you put the hamburger helper on top of it, and then you put a layer of, of the chips again. And of course, you can, use, you can eat it in a lot of different ways. Anyway, I ate it, and the hamburger was spoiled. Um, so the next day when I went to work, I just vomited like a crazy man. <clears throat> I, had, I, was, I was poisoned. 
food poisoning. I couldn't eat, uh, I couldn't eat uh, corn chips. I couldn't eat Doritos for like 30 years, mm -hmm. 40 years. Uh, I had a taste aversion right? mm -hmm. I, 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 with those chips. I just couldn't do it. Yeah. Ugh, I know, it was terrible. <laughs> That happened to me with Arby's. To this day, I don't go to Arby's. You know, the funny thing is, I stopped at Arby's. Usually, when I went to Gallup. Yeah. Well, you know, I went to Gallup. <laughs> I went to Gallup, and usually, I stop at Freddy's, which is yeah, but but they closed Freddy's. It's it's closed now. Wow. Yeah, I know. I was shocked. That just opened. I know it just opened like two months ago, and now it's it's closed. Uh, so I had to figure out something, some place to go. So I figured, well, I'll just stop at Arby's. So I stopped at Arby's. What did I have? Now, uh, first of all, I, I ordered all this stuff. I ordered a salad. I ordered a sandwich. I ordered curly fries, and I ordered a cherry turnover. And I got the salad. I got the curly fries. I got the sandwich, but they forgot my my uh, turnover. Of course, I didn't figure that out till I got home. So, but that's not important. Uh, but the, uh, so I ate all the stuff that I that I had, and uh, I got sick that, that night. Every time it seems to like every time I go to get to Albuquerque, I get sick. Now every time I go to Gallup, I get sick. So I don't know what's going to go, what's happening here. Where the hell am I going to stop? Hit Maybe it, Blake's. It, yeah, that's a, that's a good one. You've been hitting the wrong spots. Bruce. <laughs> it's possible. Freddy's was okay. I love their yeah. their uh, milkshakes, nice mm -hmm. and thick, and they serve them with a with a straw that's like this big around, so you can actually get something up there. <laughs> there's a Carl's Jr. by Walmart, and then there's a. I, I I used to stop at Carl's Jr. Not for their lunch. I don't like their hamburgers. Uh, breakfast. 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 Yeah. And there's a there's a spot way on top. Uh, a Rocket Cafe. That one's way up towards the top where the hop, the turn off up to the hospital. Okay. Rocket, Rocket, Rocket Cafe. Cafe. But you have to sit down and eat. Yeah. You can't you get. You can take a takeout. Okay. Well, maybe maybe Blake's next time. The problem with Blake's it takes them forever to cook your food. Oh yeah, because it's fresh to cook it right there and there. That's great. But Usually, you know, I'm trying to get out of it. <laughs> and it's hard to find a place to park. Oh, yeah. At Blake's. I haven't tried the Blake's in, in Window Rock. Don't go there. Don't go? No. Okay. I'll stay with Gallup. <laughs> Next time, I'll head, and getting to the Blake's in, in Gallup is, is a bit of a trick. Because yeah. you have to, well, I'm coming from Walmart, so you have to go all the way over and turn it the right place. <laughs> And drive around and around and around until somebody leaves. Anyway, well, maybe next time. Okay, so we're talking about taste aversions. Most toxins are bitter tasting, and, and for that reason, of course, if you taste anything bitter, if you bite into your pills or uh, if you uh, take any medicines, they're always bitter. And that's the reason they work, is because they're, they're poisons. Many people suffer from neophobia, the fear of new foods. Not a real fan of new foods. You never know what you're going to get a hold of. Um, I can't eat barbecue anymore. They put something in barbecue that just burns a hole right through my gut. So I can't eat barbecue. I know. Uh, Sue's husband makes the best barbecue. Who does? Sue's husband. Yeah, that's pretty good barbecue. I Actually, I have a, a jar of of his, uh, his barbecue sauce. sauce. Yeah. One of the hormones released uh, in the stomach and, and intestines is cholecystokinin, or CCK, uh, which uh, comes from your gallbladder. Cholecystokinin. Um, so if you have a if you have your gallbladder taken out, it's called a cholecystectomy. Uh, cholecystokinin is released if foods that have a high content of fat or, fat or proteins. Uh, so if you lose your gallbladder, one of the things that happens is they tell you to, to uh, cut down on your, on your meat eating because now you can't break it down. You don't have cholecystokinin to break it down. So it'll just run through your body. You'll still break down some of, those, some of your proteins and fats in your, uh, in your intestines, your stomach a little bit, but your intestines 
uh, but it'll give you diarrhea if you're not careful. Cholecystokinin also stimulates the pancreas to release insulin, and uh, of course this can be a problem uh, if you've had your gallbladder taken out. So it's one of the reasons why if you've had your gallbladder taken out, they put you on a, on a diet uh, that is, is relatively low in proteins and low in fats. Otherwise, you might kick yourself into type 2 diabetes. Uh, cholecystokinin may be one of the satiety signals, but the problem is, of course, you can't give somebody a shot of cholecystokinin. You would never, ever give somebody a shot of cholecystokinin uh, because instead of making you feel full, it will uh, make you feel sick. Uh, which is kind of the same thing, I guess. It, it makes you, and it makes your stomach spasm, which isn't good. So it gives you nausea and cramps. Uh, cholecystokinin in the presence of food activates the muscles of the intestines to work. Absence of food, of course, leads to feelings of nausea and cramping. And this is what happens to you. It takes your stomach about four hours to empty after you've eaten. Uh, so if after you've eaten, if, if all of a sudden you get uh, hunger uh, signals, uh, sometimes you'll, you'll pump uh, cholecystokinin into your system in anticipation of eating, and that will make you feel sick. So if this ever happens to you, you're, you're, uh, it's been over four hours since you've eaten, and all of a sudden you feel nauseous and cramping, it may be because uh, you're anticipating eating something and the cholecystokinin is making you feel sick. So be careful. Or, may, or just be aware of it, I guess. If you eat, uh, it'll, t it'll go away, strangely enough. But of course, you feel kind of bloated with this. <laughs> there are several hunger triggers. Uh, one of them is low insulin in the blood. It's an obvious one. Uh, another one is high insulin levels. Uh, however, high insulin levels do not equate to satiation. Uh, that's one of the reasons why people who are obese um, overeat. They overeat because they don't know what what satiation feels like. Satiety uh, appears to spread over various regions in the brain, including the amygdaloid nuclei, the frontal cortex, and the substantia nigra. Uh, the pr frontal cortex, of course, the substantia nigra is way down in your brain stem, but the frontal cortex, this is the reasoning portion of your brain. And of course, and this has been happening to me lately. Uh, I've been eating I used to overeat a lot, um, I don't know, because I could, I guess. But uh, here lately, uh, I've been stopping before I've finished eating everything, which the dogs think is great, because they get the rest of my sandwich or whatever I'm eating. But uh, it's a reasoning portion of your brain, the frontal cortex, of course, and it tells you, it should tell you uh, when you've had enough food. Leptin is a protein produced by fat uh, cells uh, that is secreted and informs the brain that the individual has had enough food. Leptin. Obese people seem to be insensitive to leptin's message, and uh, that is why they eat to excess. Uh, when leptin reaches the hypothalamic uh, arcuate uh, nucleus, it suppresses the release of several peptide uh, neuropeptides, neurotransmitters that induce eating. A neuropeptide Y is one of them. The other one is a goonie related peptide. And this is really kind of a strange uh, chemical that we discovered. The agouti is a rodent from, uh, it's a big, big rodent from South America. And they were doing uh, experiments on it and they discovered that, the, uh, that there was a neurotransmitter that we had never identified that was very similar to the one they found in the agouti. And now, of course, we refer to it as the agouti-related peptide. At, at one point, they thought that they could use this uh, as a diet uh, me uh, mechanism, uh, but they haven't figured out how to do it yet. So they have what they call the agouti-related peptide. I'll show you a picture of it in just a second. Leptin also enhances the release of the peptide alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone. That's what an agouti looks like. As you can see, it's not the most attractive animal in the world. It's about the size of a uh, cat, maybe a little bit bigger. <clears throat> As you can see, it's got long legs. Uh, they, uh, they, they feed a lot of animals. <laughs> but then again, there aren't a lot of large predators in, uh, in South America, which may be the reason that this animal has been able to survive for, well, 
forever. Um, anyway, they're kind of an ugly animal. They're, well, we talked about this last time. They're a rat without a tail, but they're big. I mean, they're big. I saw one when I was in uh, Guatemala. I saw an agouti just walking around. I wasn't scared of anything. There's nothing to be afraid of. Humans don't eat them, so they're not afraid of humans. There's no uh, jaguars are about the only thing that would could potentially kill them. And of course, humans have killed off all, almost all the, the jaguars. So this guy's just walking around. We were at a temple, uh, Tikal, uh, and uh, there, here, there was a, an agouti, an ugly thing. Of course, everybody thought it was a rat, but it's not quite the same thing. They're pretty, pretty damn big. Anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa are two disorders of hunger management that leads to extreme emaciation and even death. Anorexics commonly desire and think about food. They think about food constantly, but they deny themselves any food. The basic problem seems to be a distorted body image where the individual sees themselves incorrectly as overweight when they are actually thin to the point of death. Uh, they look like they've just come out of a a, a German concentration camp, or a Japanese concentration camp. As you can see, they're pretty bony, skeletal, as it were. Anorexics tend to be slender of build to begin with, and the excessive uh, dieting merely adds to the emaciation. Uh, this used to be a problem that was almost exclusively in the, uh, uh, in the white community, but um, Somebody that we know, who is it, who is it, who is it? Um, the lady that used to run around with Paris Hilton, she's black, or she has black ancestry. Uh, not Lionel Richie's mm -hmm. daughter. She was, she was anorexic, so was Paris Hilton for a while. Uh, of course, both of them, uh, what is her name? Nicole Richie, that's her name. Nicole Ritchie uh, got married and had a baby, and after that she hasn't had any problems with anorexia anymore. But there for a while she was looking like death warmed over. Ugly, ugly stuff. Bulimia tends to be a little, uh, bulimics tend to be a little bit plumper than anorexics. Uh, they are able to control their weight by purging the food from their system, either through exercise, vomiting, or laxatives. Um, a famous person that used laxatives, who was a bulimic, uh, who used laxatives was uh, Audrey Hepburn. She used laxatives. That's why she had such a long, slender neck. A uh, very thin lady. Uh, interestingly, she, during World War II, she was in the, in the resistance in Holland, and uh, she was only 15 or 16 years old. Um, but uh, there was a time. For about 18 months, Germans took all their food, and they wouldn't let them have any food. So they were eating things like uh, tulip bulbs, which are toxic. Uh, but they're eating strange foods, and that's when she became so so toxic, uh, or so so slender. Uh, but uh, it also gave her diarrhea, which felt normal to her since she had lived for an extended length of time with. With, with the problem. Uh, so she just continued to uh, use laxatives all of her life to stay slender. She eventually died of, um, of colon cancer. She overstimulated her colon with, with the uh, diarrhea. Bulimics uh, will also go a little crazy from time to time and eat massive amounts of food at one sitting and then they'll relieve themselves of it through vomiting. This is known as binging and purging, and that's the end of chapter whatever, 13, I think. I think, maybe, yeah, 13. Uh, 14 has to do with sleep. <laughs> he got cold last night. And I hadn't adjusted my, my covers yet. Maybe I'll do that tonight. So I got cold during the night. And I woke up. Of course, the dogs needed to go outside, or at least one of them did. Big baby. <laughs> well, I'd rather I'd rather he peed outside than inside, or on me. 
So uh, chapter 14 is about sleep. The problem is that I woke up uh, this morning and it was too early to get up and I laid back down and went to sleep and stayed, stayed in bed until, until it was too late to get up. <laughs> so, but I made it to work fairly well. I, I did okay. Uh, most creatures uh, display a daily rhythm that approximates about 24 hours. For this reason, it's called the circadian rhythm, circa meaning around and dia meaning day or around the day rhythm. Uh, animals who are awake at night and sleep during the day, uh, like most rodents, are called nocturnal. And this is one of, the one of the reasons why my cat wanted to go out last night. She wanted to catch mice. Animals that are awake during the day and asleep during the night are called diurnal. And that's us, we're diurnal, most of us are anyway. This behavior may be controlled through the animal's hormonal structure. And so we've got nocturnal and diurnal and circadian rhythms. When a creature is not given definite uh, external cues such as the winter uh, or light, uh, they must maintain their own cycle and process known as free running. Um, I don't know if you've ever been in this situation when I was in Germany. When we were stationed in Germany, uh, they put us in, the Germans built all these caves. The Germans had a plan. I, I'm not exactly sure what it was, but they built all these caves. Uh, so after we defeated the Germans in World War II, of course, we took over a lot of that stuff in Germany. Um, one of them was their caves. So when we were over there, uh, there was, this was in 79 through 82. Uh, in eight, 1980, uh, the Russians invaded Afghanistan. And there was a there was talk, and of course we were upset. We told them to get out. And they said, you know, up yours, Americans. Uh, so there was a possibility that we were going to war with the Russians. So one of the things that we did, uh, we practiced uh, what, what they call in, in the medical field, the military medical field, bugging out. Bugging out has to do with moving your whole hospital from one place to another. Uh, if you've ever watched MASH on television, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, so we sometimes we just have to pick everything up and move it. Uh, so one of the places that we were going to go is in one of these mountains. Uh, so we practiced moving everything into the mountain. Where were we going to set up the lab? Where were we, where were we going to set up surgery? It's cold in there. It's really, really cold. It's like uh, the ambient temperature is in the 50s, so it's pretty damn cold. And you can't heat it. You know, you can't, because it's under, it's in, it's rock. It's, I don't know if you've ever been around a stone building, but they're really hard to heat because they, the uh, heat doesn't bounce off. It absorbs into the rock. So, you know, you get a blast of air, you get a blast of hot air, but that hot air isn't going to stay there. It's all going to be absorbed into these cold rocks. So it was pretty, it was pretty strange situation. Uh, so we were underground for about seven days. Practice, we were practicing, just in case. You know, you know what's going to happen next. Uh, so here we are, we're, under, we're underground. Of course, I was in the lab. And the lab's always at the end. And so it's either at this end or it's at that end. And unfortunately, it was at that end. So we were, we were the deepest in the mountain. <clears throat> and it's cold down there. Uh, and that was kind of a problem because we needed to... Uh, uh, to heat our instruments. Our instruments didn't work properly at, at that temperature. And the farther you, you went into the mountain, the colder it got. Well, anyways, we hadn't seen the sun in about a week. Um, and, of course, you're, you've got clocks, uh, but I've got a problem. Not with, it, not with these electronic clocks. These are okay. But the, the, uh, the mechanical clocks, um, my, if, if I wear a mechanical clock, it always Goes, it runs fast, it always runs fast. So I never knew what time it was. My, my watch was always off, and so I just I, don't, I stopped wearing watches. There's something about me that makes my watch run fast, okay? <laughs> anyway, so while we were underground, we, people kept going, what time does it feel like to you? Of course, you know, it, we've been in the dark for four days, so what, what, what time does it feel like to you? That didn't make any sense. Uh, so we were free running, which was really kind of interesting. Uh, we had clocks, but uh, because it was so cold, the mechanical clocks ran slow. My, my watch ran fast, of course, 
uh, and, and everybody had to guess what time it was. Um, the deeper you were in the mountain, the slower your clock was. The closer you were to the mouth of the mountain, this is in the winter time too, closer you were uh, to the mouth of the mountain, the faster the clocks ran. So nobody, nobody was on the right time. Eventually, after about three days, they just stopped talking about what time it was, as if it wasn't important. So we were all free running. We, we all had to, to uh, try to figure out what time it was, as far as our brains were concerned. Um, some people wanted to sleep all the time, and other individuals didn't, didn't want to sleep at all. So they were staying up you know, all the time. Uh, it was really kind of fascinating. Uh, we went out and we thought it was nighttime. You know, your brain tells you 24 hours, 24 hours, 24 hours. We thought it was nighttime. Of course, we were the ones deepest in the mountain. <clears throat> we thought it was nighttime. We went outside, it was in the morning. So we were about four or five hours off in our brains. And, and it, I mean, it's like, it's like jet lag. Uh, we just couldn't, we couldn't rationalize it in our own minds. Anyway, that has to do with free running. When an animal, including man, is allowed free running circadian rhythms with no external cues, they tend to run a little behind 24 hours, and that's what happened to us. But then again, we were the deepest in the mountain. Uh, the people closest to the mouth uh, were actually able to go outside. Uh, they weren't supposed to, but they did. And they, or they could peek out and, and see what, how dark it was. Um, any cue that, and it's really dark in the mountain. I don't know if you've ever been in a cave or, or what. But it's black. I mean, it's you can't see anything. There is no light whatsoever. We went in a cave in uh, what's it called in uh, Carlsbad. No, it would be in South Dakota. Oh, really? Yeah, what's that canyon or that cave called? Uh, gosh, I know it? Devil's Tower, no, no, but that's a mountain. South North Dakota, I think it is. By that um, crazy horse. Crazy horse. Yeah. Oh, okay, so you went to the Crazy Horse Monument. I did, and then there's a cave nearby there. I didn't realize that. My wife's been there, but I've never been there. Yeah. She bought me a shirt. I have a shirt that says Crazy Horse Monument. Yeah. And there's a cave there, somewhere around there. I'm trying to think. I know it's a cave, but you go in, and it goes all the way back into the, and it's just dark. It's so cold down there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> scary. I was, like, unclaustrophobic, so I'm like, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty damn cold. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Bruce, there's a uh, the term free running. Yeah, I seen that um, with uh, I, used to, I used to work with uh, with uh, Coconino County uh, with, within the the kitchen the cook area, and when we would uh, when their services needed in the prison area, the prisoner area, the inmate area, you could see some of them just sleeping all day, uh -huh. and that's all they did. Some would walk out, do the walk around, and some would go outside. But everything is going to stop. I noticed that that, uh, that free run you're, you're talking about uh, somewhere some of the prisoners you know, or inmates will sleep all day and then when they come to uh, pick up their uh, food or just uh, give them food, it's when they wake up and they come and they pick up their food. Like it's vampire. almost like a rat, you know, like a, like a, like a mouse. You know, or a vampire. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I noticed that when you're talking about free running, that, that yeah, it's kind of weird. Any cue that an animal uses to synchronize their rhythm is called Zeitgeber. Uh, it's German for time giver, Zeitgeber. Time giver. Uh, and we, we use different, different techniques. Usually it's sunlight. Uh, and that may be one, that's one of the reasons why when uh, we went on daylight savings time uh, last Saturday, no, it was two, two Sundays ago, it probably threw your brain way, way off. That's because daylight is one of your zeitgebers. <clears throat> Researchers have discovered that a small region in the hypothalamus called the suprachiasmatic uh, nucleus uh, serves as a circadian oscillator. The SCN triggers metabolic activity. Remember, most of your met metabolism occurs uh, uh, while you're asleep, and this is the and but it's right at the beginning of just your sleep cycle. Uh, so usually it, it gets taken care of, whether you get awakened. If you sleep for, for an hour and a half or two hours, you're, you're probably good to go as far as your metabolism is concerned. 
the suprachiasmatic nucleus is the master pacemaker. Lesions of the suprachiasmatic uh, nucleus abolish free running rhythms. Uh, activity in suprachiasmatic nucleus correlates with circadian rhythms. Isolated suprachiasmatic nucleus continues to cycle. Transplanted suprachiasmatic nucleus imparts rhythm of the donor. So it is, uh, it all depends on your donor. So if you had this region of your brain replaced uh, with uh, some rock and roll freak that stays up all night and sleeps all day, uh, you would start doing the same thing. You'd better start sleeping during the day. Or somebody that worked uh, graveyard shift. <clears throat> That's a tough one. I used to work day shift through the week, and then on the weekends I worked, I worked a graveyard shift. I worked two graveyard shifts. That was tough. That was really tough. But we needed the money. <clears throat> we normally produce uh, different intensity, intensities of electricity in our brains. Uh, while we are awake, we produce short, rapid waves known as beta waves. Uh, this is the beta wave right there. Uh, when we are relaxed or drowsy, uh, we will produce alpha waves, and they get, uh, as you can see, it's, uh, there are more of them. Uh, those are alpha waves, a little bit taller. We're starting to go to sleep. Beta waves, alpha waves. As we get sleepier, of course, the waves get taller and taller and taller. There you go. In stage one uh, of sleep, we begin producing theta waves. In stage two of sleep, we produce theta waves with sleep spindles. This is a sleep spindle right here. As you can see, we get long. If you're, uh, let's say that uh, my, my lecture is more boring than usual, and you start to fall asleep, um, all of a sudden you'll have this really strange dream cycle. I mean, it's like, uh, and, and it only lasts for a couple seconds. But it's like uh, I'm laying under a tree and a bird comes flying by and I grab at it. And maybe you actually move and grab at the bird. Uh, but that's a sleep spin. That, that, little, that little piece of, of a dream that you dream is a, is a sleep spin. And sometimes it lasts for only a couple seconds. But that's a sleep spin. And that's what, that's what it looks like on your brain waves. In stage three sleep, delta waves first appear, and this is uh, these are these are delta waves as you can see. Delta just it means triangle, so they're triangular shape, and they're very tall, just like a sleep spindle is. In stage four, the majority of the waves are delta waves. The last stage, of course, is marked by rapid eye movement, and this is referred to as REM. This is what REM looks like. Uh, wait a minute, let's go back to what. As you can see, it's very similar to uh, beta waves, REM, yeah. Um, you will dream here, you'll dream here, and you'll dream here. These are all dreams that you have. The dreams in delta wave, especially at the beginning of the sleep cycle, tend to be realistic dreams. So you're dreaming about something that has happened to you, something that's on your mind. Uh, in, uh, in REM sleep, it usually doesn't have anything to do with anything. What did I dream the other day? I dreamed that uh, I was elected to Congress. <laughs> I know, uh, but I didn't have to. I didn't have to campaign because what happened? Uh, Everything Well, it was like a last-second thing. They decided to put me on the ballot, and the guy that I was running against was had committed some crime or something. Of course, there were two people that were indicted under indictment who ran for Congress. Uh, on November 6th, and they won. One's in Upper New York State, the other one's in San Diego. And they both won, even though they're under indictment. Of course, their cases look awfully strong, and we'll see what happens, but uh, it's awfully strong. In stage one and two, the individual uh, is often not aware that they are asleep. They are unresponsive to external stimuli, but at the same time, they, they think that they're awake. Um, their ears, they stop hearing things. But, uh, and that's all they, they're thinking, they're just not listening. But the reality is they're asleep. Stage three and four is the most relaxing form of sleep. However, it is during these stages that most people do their sleep walking 
and talking early in the night when these stages are longer. Uh, yeah, so uh, if you're going to sleep talk or sleep walk, and this happened to me, evidently this happened to me, uh, one of the things I don't usually tell people is that the night that my wife stabbed me, evidently I was sleep talking. And that was, part, that was part of what she was angry about. I have no idea what I said. Of course, I have no idea what I said. I was asleep. But uh, she said that I said something. I'm not exactly sure what it was. But she was, that was part of her hysteria, was evidently what I said. I must have called her a bitch or something. I don't know. That's worth stabbing somebody over. Uh, during our, she thought we were having a conversation. And evidently, I, I said something. Uh, and then she stabbed me. <clears throat> she went to the kitchen and got a knife and stabbed me. It was the same knife she had used to stab me earlier in the day. Which luckily was a steak knife. So, I mean, if it had been a, a stiletto or something, she probably would have killed me. <clears throat> um, she probably bounced off my rib. I've got, I've got pecs. Uh, so she had to go through that muscle to get to my rib cage. Anyway, and it stuck. It stuck. So when I stood up, it was still stuck in my chest. <clears throat> She's the only woman that's ever stabbed me, okay? <laughs> she did it while you were sleeping. And she did it while I was asleep. She may have thought I was awake. I don't know. It's it possible. It reminds me of that. Um, that movie Zombie World, where the uh, Bill Murray. Oh yeah. Shot. This is how you treat somebody. <laughs> <laughs> Zombie Land. Zombie Land. Yeah. Zombie Land. With uh, Emma Stone and I can't remember the kid's name. Woody Harrelson's in it. During REM, all movement is suspended. The heart rate is increased. The blood pressure is up, and brain activity is at is at a waking level. That's during REM. The most vivid dreams occur during this stage, and of course, I had the dream about being elected to Congress, which was a little weird, because I'm running around in a, in a maroon jacket, and I, and I kept thinking, I can't wear a maroon jacket. I'm not supposed to be in a maroon jacket. Anyway, and nobody recognized me. That was a funny thing. <clears throat> of course, I hadn't had to run for Congress. I was just elected to Congress. Uh, and if denied REM, the individual will begin to act psychotic. So evidently this has to do with dissipation of anxiety, dissipation of something. And we're not exactly sure what it is. But if we, if we uh, keep people from having, going into REM sleep, they will become psychotic. We've seen this over and over and over again uh, with just about everybody. Uh, once upon a time there, there was a disc jockey from, uh, where was I? Omaha. And uh, he locked himself in the radio station. This was a, this was a game that they were playing. And he played uh, uh, Mickey, Mickey, you're so fine, you're so fine, you blow my mind. Over and over and over again for like 12 hours straight. And theoretically, he was supposed to have locked himself into this place. <clears throat> anyway, at the end, he was, he was kind of blabbering. I mean, it didn't make any sense whatsoever. But he was, he was, it was, it was, it was a, a ploy. They, but he did have to stay away because he was on the radio for, I don't know, for 36 hours straight or something. And by the time he, you could barely understand what he said. But he kept playing the song over and over again, and he kept saying, "People are calling in. They want to, they want to hear, they want to hear something else." And then he'd say, "And and here you go." And then it'd be Mickey, Mickey, you're still playing. Weird. Anyway, uh, he, he and he uh, sounded psychotic. Of course, a lot of times he sounded kind of goofy, but uh, that was the last time he was on the radio. I don't know. It was a joke. I mean, it wasn't real. Another time they had uh, what did they? It was it was the end of the summer, and they had a water world where they had this water slide, and the people would uh, the last person standing. Was the was the deal? So they uh, they go up and down this water slide, and every 15 minutes they got a two-minute break or something. Anyway, they had to stay awake, and it started out with like 130 people or something, 
and pretty soon after about 36 hours, it was they were down to three or four people. And then they slowly, and they kept talk, uh, asking them, you know, asking them questions. It gets cold at night, so these guys were freezing to death. And they would ask him questions, and they were okay for the first day. You know, oh, I'm gonna win. You know, I can do this. I can do this until the cows come home. That kind of stuff. And pretty soon they were real sleepy, and they weren't making making any sense at all. They finally had to stop it. The uh, people from the hospital were listening, and uh, one of the doctors came over and said, "You got to you've got to cut this thing off, or you're going to drive these people nuts." Literally, they're going to, going to go psychotic. So they stopped it, and they, there were two people left, I think, and they both won. It was like a pass, a year's pass for water warriors. As the night progresses, the length of time a person spends in REM increases. Dreams in REM in the first part of the night tend to be realistic, while those toward morning are longer and more vivid. Uh, we do know that you dream during uh, delta wave sleep, and it tends to be uh, these intrusive dreams. Uh, a lot of veterans have PTSD. Uh, they, they would have these dreams. Oh, I was reading something. Oh, about a uh, tank, uh, a, a, a tank commander uh, during World War II who, um, who shot, there was a, they were in Cologne. In a, in a large uh, 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 open area in Cologne, and a car came zipping through, and of course their orders were to to fire at anything that moved, that moved, and shoot at everything that moved was their orders. So this car comes running through, and of course he hits it with his machine gun, with his 30 caliber machine gun. At the same time, uh, there was a German on the other side of the, the road. And he shot the car at the same time. So they both shot the, uh, the car. And uh, the car, of course, careened off the road. And, and uh, two people spilled out. Well, one of them was a woman. And uh, he didn't know if he killed her or not. <clears throat> so for the last, what was that? The last 70 years, he's been worried, 80 years, he's been worried about whether he killed this woman or not. And now they discovered, yeah, he did. He killed her. Or somebody killed her. You know, the German shot him, shot at the same time the American did. And she was killed by 30 caliber machine gun bullets, but both of them were shooting 30 caliber machine gun bullets. One shot from uh, one door and the other shot from the other door. Uh, and she was killed. Um, and of course, it, the dreams have been haunting him. And here lately, since his wife died, he's been dreaming more and more about this woman, about the woman that he killed. And he didn't really see very much of it because, of course, he was in the middle of a, of a, of a tank battle. Um, and uh, so, you know, he shot the, the, they shot the car, and now they're focused on the, the German tank, and the German tank is focused on them. You know, so this is an instant in war, and, and nobody knew what, what happened, but it, as it turned out, they, she did die. She, she died. And it turned out that the German gunner that, that had shot her, was having exactly the same dreams as the American gun. So they got together. Eventually they got together. It was, it was all filmed. And it was in a documentary. And this has happened to me. You know, I'm watching a documentary and all of a sudden, oh, I'm there, that's me. And, you know, it was a little bit shocking. Uh, but uh, they were both watching documentaries. This film had been uh, declassified. And all of a sudden it's on the airwaves. Yeah. And both of them see it. And both of them start having bad dreams about this woman dying. Mm -hmm. They didn't know whether she died or not. All they knew was that they were taking care. The American uh, medics were trying to save her life. And they did, discovered that she did die. <clears throat> and the two of them got together and to talk to each other, even though they had been enemies. And, they, and, and the American tank had knocked out the German tank. He hadn't killed the guy. Uh, he was captured right after that. Uh, but they both got together, and uh, it, it, it made them uh, two enemies coming together and talking about the same incident from two different perspectives uh, gave them peace. And so they stopped having the, the vivid dreams and whatnot. The German gunner died uh, in 2017, and, but the, the American guy is still alive somewhere. Anyway. Uh, 
vivid dreams. That's what we're talking about, vivid dreams. People actually dream throughout the night with realistic dreams happening in non-REM sleep and more vivid imagery happening during REM. Individuals who are depressed uh, tend to have more dreams that, that are more intense than normal. Uh, it is thought that the excess, uh, dream, excess dreaming is due to a state of hyperarousal from excess worrying and that has to do with uh, depression. So this is one of the ways you can determine if somebody is depressed. Ask them about their dreams. Are you sleeping too much? Uh, a lot of times uh, uh, people that are depressed will, will uh, have insomnia. And the reason is because they don't want to go to sleep. Same way with guys with PTSD. So is PTSD a form of depression? Uh, potentially, yeah. But uh, guys with PTSD will have the same problem. They don't want to go to sleep because they know what they're going to dream about or they're afraid they know what they're going to dream about. Night terrors occur in the early hours of the sleep cycle where, while the sleeper is in stage three or four. Night terrors are more prevalent in males than females and tend to be more common in children. Uh, it is almost impossible to wake someone from a night terror and they often strike out at the person trying to awaken them. Uh, when I was up in, at Fort, Fort Belknap, uh, we had a young lady that was uh, sent to juvie and the reason she was sent to juvie was because one night she was dreaming she had a night terror and she came running out of her, her bedroom her father tried to tried to stop her tried to quiet her down and she cold cocked him she knocked him out she punched him and knocked him out well this little girl's in the eighth grade not very big her father was a boxer and her father her father had never been beaten. <laughs> I mean, he was huge. This guy must have weighed 250, 300 pounds. He was big, and he was, you know, he was all shoulders and jaw. He had this huge, huge head and huge jaw. Anyway, she cold cocked him, and they thought, nobody knew that she was having a night terror. She had just come running out of her bedroom they thought uh, that uh, she didn't like her, her stepfather. It was her stepfather, it wasn't her dad. It was her stepfather. And so they sent her to juvie, and she was there for four years. They, they sent her away to boarding school, is what they did. But it was a, it wasn't that kind of a boarding school. It was, a, it was actually a juvenile hall. So, um, and so she graduated from this other high school. From, she was from, for Belknap, they sent her off to South Dakota someplace for troubled teens, you know, that was the idea. And then she, when she came back, uh, she took, started taking some psych classes. And eventually we got to the point, she, every time we talked about this kind of stuff, she'd go, is that real? Is that, can that really happen? I mean, nobody even thought about it. And eventually we figured out what had happened. She'd been having a dream about monsters. And her dad, uh, when she went running out of the room, she had no idea. She wasn't awake. She was still in her stage three or four. And she was having a night terror. And so she was sleepwalking. And when he tried, to, when he grabbed a hold of her, she thought he was a monster. So she started swinging at him. And she hit, got him right on the point of the chin and knocked him out, which had never happened before. <laughs> <laughs> you would have thought she would have broken her knuckle or something, I mean, on this guy's chin, because that's really, that's really hard. But she caught him unaware, she caught him, he wasn't, uh, he wasn't uh, you know, tightening up his muscles. She caught him when he was completely uh, unprotected, and she dropped him. And, uh, and then they, they sent her to juvie, and she was in juvie for a long time. Um, she, she, she had no clue. She had no clue what was going on until she took my psych class and we talked about this a couple times and eventually she figured out what had happened. Yeah. So then she went to her dad and she told him. Of course, he wasn't mad. I mean, that wasn't the point. The idea was that she knocked this guy out and they had to take him to the hospital. He had a concussion because he, when he dropped, he fell on the, he fell on the uh, there was a heating thing and he busted it. You know, it was uh, this thing that stuck out from the wall, and, and he hit it, and he, he got a concussion. Uh, so it was like she was trying to kill him or something. Anyway, she almost did kill him, actually. 
But he wasn't mad. I mean, that wasn't the point. But they, they took her away, and they wouldn't let her come back because they were afraid that there would be repercussions and whatnot. You know how stupid people are. Anyway, that's what happened. She had a night terror. And she couldn't date anybody. Um, she was afraid to date people. She didn't know what had happened. Uh, and after, after this happened, after we determined that it was a night terror, uh, she got married and had, had a couple kids. So I guess everything turned out OK. <laughs> she married another student. <laughs> uh, one of my other students. I'm a, I'm a troublemaker. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't, it's not like I introduced them, they sat down beside each other, it wasn't my fault. <laughs> Nightmares uh, occur in the REM sleep and happen uh, more often to girls than boys. Uh, these dreams seem to be longer in duration and occur late in the sleep cycle when REM is dominant. So you usually have night terrors at the beginning of your sleep cycle, right after they go to bed. Nightmares occur just before they wake up in the morning. Nightmares happen more with girls than, than boys. Night terrors happen more with boys than girls. <clears throat> and of course, PTSD is a form of night terror. Um, these these uh, recurring dreams, it's usually in the form of a night terror. Uh, a lot of times, the uh, dreams that you have, the, these intrusive dreams, uh, they have, to, have more to do with probabilities than actualities. Uh, this is what happened. Uh, if some, if uh, you know, if I hadn't ducked, a bullet would have gone through my head instead of the guy behind me. This has happened to me. I was in a helicopter. I bent over. There was a bullet came through into the helicopter and hit this guy right in the head, right between the eyes. It was the most perfect shot you ever saw. I mean, it hit it, drilled him right between the eyes. But obviously, they were aiming at me because I had just bent over. I mean, like a nanosecond before, and it went right over, right past my ear, right over my shoulder, and right into this guy's forehead. What a shot. What an amazing shot. But like I said, they're, they're aiming at me. I was the one that was closest to the door. So, yeah, I had a friend that, uh, he was a ranger, he was an army ranger. He's alert, long range reconnaissance guy, long, long range patrol. So they'd send them out for you know, two or three weeks and they'd have to carry everything, like all their food and all their water. So here he is, he's, uh, they, they're just head, heading out and, and uh, um, he, he bent over to go under a limb, you know, he bent over like this and a bullet went right through his, it went, hit his collar, you know, it, 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 uh, he had, he had a, 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 a bag it wasn't a. It wasn't a backpack. It was a bag that's hanging off his, his hip, and it clipped the uh, the strap on his on his bag. I mean, he just bent over and to to go under the limb, and the bullet went through into his collar and clipped that thing and busted the the strap. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so he's dragging his stuff for the rest of the time, which pissed him off, of course. But he was a lot happier not being dead, I guess. Mm -hmm. but, Anyway, and by the time the end of the by the end of the uh, patrol, uh, his shirt had it, it had clipped his collar, so it had split it. It was an AK-47 round, and it had just clipped it. So his shirt slowly came apart in the back, and it slowly opened up in the back. That, he was pissed off about that too, because it was his favorite shirt. But, Humans of different ages sleep uh, differently. Uh, most infants do not uh, develop stable sleeping patterns for several weeks after birth. Premature infants may spend as much as 80% of their sleep in REM. A full-term infant will spend about 50% of their, their night in REM. Premature infants are really kind of interesting because uh, you'll watch them sleeping and of course it looks like fitful sleeping. But the reason it looks so fitful is because it's, in, it's, it's REM. So you can see movement, but usually right behind their eyes. A full-term infant, of course, will only spend about 50% of their night in REM. REM sleep declines as people age, but it accounts for about 20% of the sleep in an average adult. Uh, if we're talking about REM sleep, 
One of the reasons why uh, cats and dogs wake up so readily is because they spend so much time in REM sleep. You can imagine a cat. Cats are, are not, uh, they, they sleep, they're, sing, they're very singular hunters. They live alone. Uh, so a cat is, a, is relatively vulnerable. And this is one of the reasons why cats, you can't sneak up on a cat even when they're asleep because they're in REM sleep and they'll wake up. But it's so that they can stay alive. It's very, it's kind of interesting. Dogs, on the other hand, you can, you can sneak up on dogs. <laughs> because dogs are pack animals and usually they're sleeping in a pack. And normally there's somebody that's awake watching the pack uh, and barking or doing something stupid. But uh, uh, usually the dogs go into fairly deep sleep fairly quickly. Sleep deprivation uh, studies have been conducted on subjects and it was demonstrated that after a prolonged period of time, the individual showed signs of hallucinations, irritability, difficulty in concentration, and disorientation. And that's what we saw uh, when I was talking about the uh, those individuals who were trying to stay awake for extended lengths of, lengths of time. We saw all of those things. And of course, they tried to be on the radio, and it just didn't work. Uh, the, the disc jockey, of course, uh, that was the last time he was on the radio that I'm aware of. Maybe he was quitting the field, I don't know. Maybe that's why they pretended that, to, that he locked himself in the, in the radio station, played that song over and over and over again. Uh, it was theoretically it was a joke, but by the end of it, he wasn't sounding very funny. Uh, he was a pretty funny guy, but uh, by the end of it, he wasn't sounding funny at all. It was more of this stuff that we were hearing on the radio. Uh, as it turned out, uh, it was supposed to be a joke, uh, but the longer he was in there, he actually did lock the door and wouldn't let him in. Uh, they had to turn off the elect the uh, power. Uh, to get him out of the place, as it turned out. <clears throat> they didn't charge him with anything because everybody knew what was going on. And it was, like I said, it was supposed to be a joke. By the end of it, uh, he actually did think that, that he was locking himself in there and all of these things were taking place. This was in Omaha, back in, I can't remember when, Mickey, Mickey, You're So Fine was so popular. It was a number one song and everybody made fun of it. And this is the reason he, he did that, was to make everybody sick of it. So if you're listening to the station, he usually told a joke before, it, you know, oh, I'm going to play another song. <laughs> and he would give you the, the, the whole history on, on this, this group and, and how wonderful their song was. And then, of course, it was Mickey, Mickey. You're so fine. But these symptoms uh, seem to be more pronounced uh, in the morning and nearly absent in the late afternoon and early evening. And of course, that was when they stopped the whole thing was in the morning. So you are more disoriented in the morning uh, than you are later on. After losing sleep, an individual will not have to sleep enough hours to get back all the hours that they have lost. You can't do that. It's not like if you lose a night of sleep, you just sleep an extra eight hours the next night and you're, you're good to go. That's not the way it works. Instead, the individual will spend more hours in select stages of sleep. Uh, the first night, the individual will spend an increased number of hours in stage four sleep. In other words, in other words, delta wave sleep, uh, they've lost all that metabolism, so they need to replace that. So the first thing that they will do is they will go into a very deep sleep, uh, and they will stay there for an extended length of time. Uh, so they will sleep. Uh, so if they if they missed eight hours of sleep, uh, potentially they'll sleep uh, ten hours or twelve hours instead of eight hours uh, to get back their delta wave sleep. The second night, the individual will spend a longer time in REM, and they will be more in. Uh, uh, they will be more intense. Their, the sleep cycle will be more intense. Remember, it's the REM sleep that uh, that dissipates this psychosis that you potentially are going through. This is how you dissipate that. Uh, the night after the the uh, delta wave sleep, the extensive delta wave sleep, uh, the individual will feel groggy uh, because they have. Uh, they have an excess amount of serotonin, and serotonin makes you feel goofy. It makes you feel dull. Even though it's the happy neurotransmitter, uh, it'll make you feel dull. 
Uh, this is a problem that people who are uh, who work graveyard shift at. Uh, these individuals, my son used to be a bartender, and he wouldn't get to bed until about 6 o'clock at night, and sometimes, uh, or 6 o'clock in the morning, uh, and sometimes he'd sleep for 12 hours until 6 o'clock the next evening. I don't know if you ever done that shift. That's a horrible, horrible shift. And he did this for years. Uh, but sometimes he would get up and uh, he would be very energized. And sometimes he'd get up and he'd just feel like, you know, feel dull. And he would have to drink coffee to get over it. Uh, what, he, if, what it was was serotonin poisoning. Or, well, not really poisoning. But he had too much serotonin, more serotonin than he needed. And at the, this point, uh, he's, he's a bodybuilder. Uh, and uh, if he, if it was one of those nights when he had too much serotonin, he couldn't lift. He didn't feel like lifting. Normally got up and he went, went to the gym and lifted, but uh, on those nights he couldn't, or those mornings, those evenings, <laughs> he couldn't do it. He couldn't lift. As interesting as that is. The basal forebrain in the back portion of the frontal cortex and the front of the hypothalamus is crucial for shortwave sleep. Uh, neurons in the, in the area are activated by sleep and use GABA as, as a neurotransmitter to inhibit other areas of the brain. Norepinephrine inhibits the area as well. <clears throat> uh, during REM sleep, you are paralyzed. The only part of your body that can move is your eyes. So you can't move. So we know that when you are sleepwalking or sleep talking, you are in, in stage four sleep, not in REM sleep. Because during REM, you are paralyzed. So if you've ever been in a situation where you dreamed that, uh, that you needed to move or somebody was going to kill you or, or whatever, you were in REM sleep and you were paralyzed. You couldn't, couldn't move. Your eyes could open. I sleep with my eyes open a lot. And it drives my life crazy. My wife's son, brother, he sleepwalks. I didn't believe it. And one night he stayed over. And I wasn't a laptop and just watching. I could, uh, the light was illuminating, so I, I would see him get up, walk to the refrigerator, and come back. And he would, uh, he would do something. I was even looking at his phone. And he was just walking around. This is my first time meeting him, so I was kind of looking at him. It was interesting. You couldn't talk to him. Did you try to talk to him? No. I, I just as I was just looking at him, we're just barely getting to know each other. And then I think I said, are you okay? Then he mumbled. So I figured, okay. So the next day that I asked him, was, do you, uh, my wife told me, does he have was, was us, was he walking around last night or anything? Was, I started laughing because, yeah, I guess, well, he said, I'm going to tell you, soup box. <laughs> Did he get anything out of the refrigerator? Did he eat anything? He just looked and he would he'd take it out and put it there and just walk off. <laughs> uh, but it, it, it happened so many, so many times, multiple times, that that's when he got to go check, get it checked out. And that's when he found out he had type 10 diabetes. Oh. So oh. That, yeah. Okay. But he's the one that uh, developed the sleep, the sleep pattern disorder. Right. And later found out he was. So he may have been eating while he was asleep. So even though he was controlling his diet while he was awake, he was he was eating while he was asleep. That's funny. Or not funny at all. That's kind of tragic, I guess. Kind of tragic. <clears throat> sleep. So this this chap this chapter and the last chapter kind of hits all at once with um, with uh, my wife's brother. It's like we were talking about sleep and later. He, and try, uh, type 2 diabetes came up. He developed type 2 diabetes, so it may have been the fact that he was eating at night Good, that yeah. caused his type 2 diabetes. When you moved to the city, it, I think that's where he kind of it developed more and more. So. Now why? Why would it develop in the city and it doesn't, he, he didn't develop it here, but it was in the city? Why would that be? I, I, uh, he used to go out a lot, so I, I would believe it would probably be the fast food and the, the late night drinking, uh, just unhealthy stuff. Which You're also, you tend to be 
uh, sleep uh, deprived if yeah. you live in the city because of all the noise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And because of all the lights. You're not used to the lights, you're not used to the noise. <clears throat> so that may be why he developed sleepwalking. Yeah. I, he was saying he, could, he was getting, it was more, his it was, it was more happening to him out, that, out in the city. Right. But sometimes he would be in the parking lot and his neighbors were asking him, well, you were out here last night. <laughs> Uh, ag it's a good thing that it was in a, uh, a gated community, mm -hmm. so he couldn't get out. No, <laughs> he needed his keys to get out. That's interesting. <clears throat> uh, you can't lock people in. That doesn't work because they can unlock it, unless it's a key. They they can't. They they don't have that type of uh, uh, digital. They can drive. They can sleep drive. <laughs> and they can sleep walk, but they can't, they, they very rarely can manipulate things like that. Mm -hmm. So if it takes a key, usually that doesn't happen. <laughs> um, we've had more people sleep driving with the fob. Oh, I have a fob. Oh with the fob. Because all they have to do is, is yeah. put this in their pocket, mm -hmm. and they're good to go. Exactly. All they have to do is touch the, the lock push on the their button. car, and it unlocks. Exactly. And then push the button. And we have a problem with drunk drivers more with the fob. We need to stop right now. Okay. Fascinating. <laughs>